United Nations forces in Korea, including units of the Greek army, bear the full brunt of the long-awaited spring offensive of the Chinese Communist armies. Once more, civilians struggle for survival as thousands, abandoning their homes, again trudge southwards. Behind the lines, Seoul once again becomes a fortress, while the big guns keep the enemy at bay. My name is Richard Dix, and this is How Did That Happen? A podcast where I look at everyday things or events and try to figure out how they came to be. Every week I will research one topic, and by the end of the episode, I hope to truly have the answer to the question, how did that happen? All right, welcome back to another episode of How Did That Happen? I am your host, Richard Dix. Uh, This is your first time listening to the podcast. Welcome, welcome, have a seat, sit down, get comfortable. I'd like to find out how things happen here uh, seven days a week. You can always find uh, all the extras over at hdthappen.com. Of course, the uh, socials are at hdthappen. Uh, Not much happening over there, you know, but um, they are still there for your enjoyment and appreciation. Uh, We're going to talk about, of course, the Korean War this week. Uh, It is in our 40s to 70s theme, which we've been working for about a month and some change now. Maybe, you know, we've really been digging in um, to it. I think we are better off for it. I must say this is um, I've learned so much in this time. And it just it's easier. They they, 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 all the episodes to me kind of just flow together a lot easier than they were uh, when we were doing it before. I think we even talked about uh, what, what, the, what the next theme might be. I mentioned it I think at the end of one of the last episodes, and I'm still thinking about doing it, which is like one of the, what are, what are the um, most influential and, or important moments of the 20th century, you know, and just kind of do like, do like a top 10 and kind of just run that down for a couple months. But we're not there yet. We still have a few more months of the 40s and 70s. We're going to get all the way. I don't think we're not going to go into the mid-70s, I don't think. We're going to stop like 72, 73, because I always think that like when, with decades, uh, the first couple years of any decade are just, they're the, just the kind of the, they're just the end of the last decade. You know what I mean? In comparison, like we, like we can easily say that, that 2013, right, is much more like 2010 than 2019 is, you know? So I think that you can cover up until 73, 73 is probably still a lot more like the 60s, obviously, than 1979 is you're almost in the 80s, you know, so it's just a little bit different. So we've got a few more years to cover with that, a few more influential people to get to before we finish the series. Um, let's see, I don't, let me go back, let me go up to the top here because I'm actually kind of just running with no script, just talking to you guys here. But what am I, what am I watching here? What did I write down? I don't know what I said. Oh, what I started Ted Lasso again. Yeah, um, I uh, enjoy it. I, I watched it the, the first couple seasons years ago and I just haven't had a chance to get to it. And I actually, I actually started it like a couple months ago. I don't know if just I was in a weird headspace, but I wasn't feeling it. I was like, this is weird, you know? So I just stopped. But I came back. I've watched, like, you know, like three or four episodes now. It's still just as good as ever. They really, I like, it's interesting to see the, the players and the, 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 the characters progress. I like when shows do that, when they don't just keep it stagnant. We love, let's watch these people go through life if, we're gonna, if it's going to be a show. Um, but yeah, it's a really good show. Um, still, the humor is still there. It's still funny. Uh, what am I listening to? I don't think I have anything new on that front. I've been listening to a lot of the same stuff. Uh, and if you listen to this podcast, you know my, you know I, know, I normally listen to. Um, I'm part of the Rogan crew as far as like like what what I listen to. It's a you know uh, Rogan, uh, Birdcast, uh, Honeydew, you know Two Bears, stuff like that. So I haven't uh, Tim Dillon. You know I haven't listened to too much more than that. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions, throw them out there. I'm always down to find something new. Uh, but as always, you know I can I plug any of those. I can plug my own other episode uh, or episodic podcast is um, Bite Size Bios. Yeah, so it used to come out. We used to. I mean, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, we used to do two shows a week, and that's wild to me. I can't believe I ever even did that. Uh, also, the, the episodes were shorter back then, so it did make a little bit more not sense, but it was easier to do when I was doing twenty minute episodes. You know, I can easily do that. But now with these more long form, which I think is how it's supposed to be. Uh, the idea of doing two shows a week is just, you know, melts the mind. But yeah, so it's every other Monday we do a bite-sized bio. We pick a person from history and just talk about their lives and kind of uh, give you the elevator pitch of who they are and why they're important in history. And because, of course, as the mini episode accompaniment, we always talk about the last episode. Uh, the big thing for me in the last uh, bite-sized bio was the, the, how can I put it, the typo or the, I, I misspoke and said the wrong amount of Cuban exiles and I couldn't correct it until the next week uh, on Bite Size Bios, but uh, but I did, and that's what the episode's for, is to try to fix things or add things that I didn't get to say in this episode like this, like for this episode, uh, there'll be some extra stuff 
on the next bite-sized bios, of course, in the beginning. But yeah, man, they go up with every. Um, now they've been going with the theme as well from the forties to seventies. We've been covering a lot of different people. We covered Stalin. Uh, we covered Truman. Uh, who else we covered? Who else have we covered in the series? That was it. that can't be it. Well, I know we we have other people coming. Let me see. What do we got? Stalin, Truman. Oh, well, that is that is yeah. There's like four others that are coming, but yeah, there's only ones we covered. Uh, well, all right. So yeah, check that out. Definitely every Monday, four thirty a.m. Uh, this one actually is coming out a little bit later. I was just actually on the road. Didn't really have time to uh to get this done on the normal time. So I'm hoping not throwing anybody off with the time slots here. But yeah, I don't think there's much else to say uh, before we get to the pod. No. So I hope you guys enjoy it. the Korean War, man. Check it out. Our foreign policy is not a political issue. Our foreign policy is not a political issue. It is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of the future of mankind. Remember this. If we do have another world war, it will be an atomic war. We could expect many atomic bombs to be dropped on American cities. And a single one of them could cause many more times the casualties than we have suffered in all the fighting in Korea. All right, so today we are talking about the Korean War, the war in Korea. And this, um, this is war that I don't know much about. I didn't know much about the Korean War before going into this. I almost actually forgot about it when I was kind of planning the, um, you know, the trajectory of this 40s to 70s kind of theme timeline that we're going through. I was uh, at least six or seven episodes in and almost pretty much through the 60s when I was like, oh, yeah, the Korean War. Um, it, it happened in the early 50s. We're going to break it down. We're going to find out uh, exactly, well, maybe not exactly, but we, I would say exactly how it happened. And it's, um, it has a lot to do with the, um, the, war, the war before it, World War II. It has a lot to do with that. I didn't know that it had so much to do with that. I really didn't. It makes so much sense because when you think about it, when you think about it, the Korean War happens, I believe, I think less than eight years after um, World War II. I mean, we go from you know, the largest war probably in the history of you know, humanity, and then a few years later... We are right there. We are right there again. So, the Korean War. Before we get to the Korean War, well, I'll, tell you what, I'll give you a quick overview, and then we're going to go back, as we normally do, and we're going to talk about a uh, small history of Korea, uh, how we got up until the point where the Korean War exists, all that good stuff. But before we do that, give you a quick uh, overview. overview of the Korean War. It was a conflict between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea. Uh, the Democratic People's was the northern side, and the Republic of Korea was the southern side. Uh, over 2.5 million people lost their lives during this war. So it was a pretty, you know, I mean, it was, it was a serious war. I think I grew up not always knowing that much about it, so thinking it wasn't that significant. But, I mean, if millions of people lose their lives, you know, it's definitely something that's worth uh, your time. The war reached uh, international proportions in June, uh, June of 1950 when the North, uh, supplied and advised by the Soviets, invaded the South. And so the United, Na- the United Nations, with the United States as the principal participant, uh, would join the war on the side of the South. And so what we'll find... As we dig into this, is this is another one of these. This probably actually the first um, proxy war of the Cold War. This is one of the first times that the Soviets um, kind of get to go up against the Americans in the West. Uh, right after we've kind of just created this idea of not quite the Iron Curtain, but the idea of that we are separate. We thought we were all together. We we're all in this together in World War II. We were all headed to Berlin together. We were all storming Berlin, trying to get Adolf Hitler together. Now that he's dead. I mean, all hell breaks loose. The only way to put it. I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're smack dab in the middle of the Cold War. And so, yeah, that happens uh, in the early 50s. Uh, the president during that time was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, let's see, like I said, it was a proxy war. It happened in uh, Korea. But how did we get here? Okay, how do we get here? So, small history of Korea. I'm not going to go all, all the way back to the beginning of, like, humanity. We'll go back to, like, the 8th century, like the Bronze Age. Uh, we'll kind of start there. What we find... Um, let's see, they found uh, uncovered let's see, pottery that indicates the Bronze Age. Korean people lived in, on hillsides um, in dugouts that were built sl- slightly above ground. Uh, half moon shaped stone reaping knives and grooved stone axes used for hoeing show that rice farming was practiced. So they were farming rice and bronze daggers and bronze arrowheads indicate participation in wars of conquest. Uh, what I found, and I, I, I try to trace this from 
from the first place I saw it on up until like kind of the last place I could ever find it is there was there was a I'm, I'm going to try to get this right. I'm trying to get this right because I don't know much about this. I'm learning about this just like with you guys. Uh, it's called Ch the Choson, the C-H-O-S-O-N. There's a little um, little sign above the second O. Kind of looks like a little macaroni noodle. Choson, right? It was the most advanced old state in what is like considered ancient Korea. Now, I think the reason this is important is because the as Korea continues on as a society, they keep coming back to this word and this people as one of the foundations of the actual Korean people themselves. Uh, but they had been around for about a thousand years at least, if not more. And they were established in the Taedong River Basin uh, in the northern part of that peninsula. And according to legend, uh, the son of heaven, Wan Nung, uh, descended to earth and married a bear-turned woman who bore a son, Tegun, the founder of Choson. Right? This woman was a bear, now she's not, and she had a kid. Right? That's how we get Choson. I mean, perhaps uh, Tengon and his descendants ruled a tribal state in which rituals were were, uh, and politics were not separated. Uh, the Choson developed into a league of tribes in the area of the Taedong and the Lao rivers. This is in the 4th century of BC, give or take. Um, about this time, they were using ironware. And th this is going back a little bit before what we just talked about, but this is kind of showing you uh, how these the Choson became. Because I'll tell you, it goes on throughout, up until almost modern times, the Choson do. Uh, let's see what's, what we're going to talk about next about these guys. Might be all I have specifically for them right now. Let's see, before we because we go from there to what is... I would say commonly known as, let's see, right before, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get the times down for you guys so I'm not like jumping you all over the place because we're going to get to a point where we get to the 1400s forward, uh, but before that, the Koreans had what was called the, it was called the Three Kingdoms, right? The Three Kingdoms were kind of how Korea was run before we get into the modern times, before we get into like European uh, colonization and anything like that. So the, the three kingdoms evolved into statehood through frequent wars of expansion and centralized military systems uh, as they were organized in training institutions in the Kogoro and, uh, hmm, not going to get that word, Hara, Harangdo, not sure. But basically, throughout years of fighting throughout the entire, basically, kind of country of Korea, it had evolved down into what it was basically three different kingdoms. Um, let me see if I can get their actual names here. Okay, so I'm still, still trying to find the names. Uh, so it's saying that the, the three kingdoms... Okay, here we go. Okay, ready for me to butcher these? These are... Uh, I'm sorry for anybody who actually knows how to pronounce these. Uh, Goguryeo. Goguryeo is G-O-G-U-R-Y-E-O. Beck J. B-A-E-K-J-E. And then Scylla, which is probably not even pronounced Scylla, but S-I-L-L-A. They, Like I said, they competed uh, for the hegemony over the Korean pen Peninsula during the ancient period of the Korean kind of uh, history itself. So that's just a that's that's just a brief uh you know overview of like Korea before we get to like the actual 1400s uh forward which I do feel is kind of um you know that's because the ancient history of of all of these countries and, and, and nations is so different than what these they would end up being in modern times that it's you speaking about them is good but it doesn't always it's not always indicative of what they would end up being becoming uh so let's see let's get to because what um what Korea would end up being before it was taken over or kind of controlled by other countries. It was, it was a, it was a dynasty. It was a, it was an, it was a aristocratic kind of, you know, lifestyle where they had uh, emperors and things like that. So when the dynasty was established, um, the territory under its control was named Choson, right? With the approval of the emperor of China, because before, before this China has a, had a very large hand in the control of Korea. Japan would uh, also, as well as, as we would come to find, that's what makes it so interesting. Why? Why I think you even see now, like Korea and China have good relations relatively, is because there's a history between the countries. They're just they're you know, they've always kind of dealt with each other. So the Choson Dynasty. That's why that's why I brought up the Choson earlier before because it's these, these same people or the same kind of culture, if you will, that runs through this entire like a through line of the Korean people. The Chosons they they were one of the first types of people in Korea. They now have the the dynasty itself is kind of controls all of Korea. It's called the Choson. And so it had 26 monarchs um, that ruled from 1392 until the Japanese annexation of Korea in 1910. We're going to get there, but that's that's what that's what Korea was before, really before the 20th century. Because when you get to the, when you get to the 20th century, that's when it gets taken over by Japan, and then we get we get to the Korean War, and then it you know it becomes its own thing. It's split in two and um, becomes something completely different. But up until then, up until that point, Korea was one entire entity that was ruled by the Chosun Dynasty. Um, Seoul was the capital, and it was actually called Hanyang during that time. 
See, they adopted uh, the Confucian ethical system. Uh, it replaced Buddhism. The Choson uh, society was dominated by a hereditary aristocratic class called the Yangban. Yangban, uh, which literally means two orders, meaning civil and military. Members of the Yangban devoted themselves to the study of Neo-Confucian orthodoxy and through civil service examinations held public offices, which is pretty much all they did. They were just kind of around, you know, being politics, being politicians, being rich people who studied Confucius. You know, they had their own printing. Uh, they made a printing press, I think, around the early 1200s, uh, movable type printing. So, yeah, I mean, this isn't really about the history of Korea, but that's if you've ever wondered uh, kind of where, you know, they, they, they came from. That's a small and uh, albeit incomplete history of that. Uh, so now we're going to jump to a little bit further down. We're going to be in the 1800s. Now we're going to talk about the last emperor of Korea. This man's name was Kojong. Kojong, right? He was born September the 8th. That's my father's birthday. 1852 in Seoul, Korea, which at the, I believe at the time was still called Hanyang. I could be wrong. Uh, but he was the last one. And he was the last one. And then it's important. It's important to mention Kojong because what you find when... After Japan takes over Korea, right, they, run, they end up running Korea for like 40 years. They take them over in 1910, uh, excuse me, about like 35. So they, they, and they, and they, um, they have them until they lose the war, until they lose World War II, you know, and they have to give it up. They have to give up all their, you know, their colonies and their, and their resources. And that, that's, that is literally, I think in a nutshell, probably truthfully, the reason why the Korean War happened. And I had it put to me very simply in a documentary that I watched. It just makes so much sense. I mean, we, it has to do with Kojong and all these people. But you basically take an, an entire country who had been existing uh, in an autonomous um, capacity for hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? I mean, different people. China came in there certain times. Japan comes in, right? And then, but then Japan comes in in 1910 and occupies them, takes over the country. It's, it's just it's just Japan now. And you find, I don't know if we have the notes in here or not, but I mean, Japan was running Korea like a, like a little mini Japan for like 30 years. They didn't run it like, oh, we own you guys, but have your own culture. Do what you want to do. No, they were like book burning. You couldn't write in Korean. You had to learn Japanese. Like it wasn't a thing. Like they were like, we're not trying to perpetuate Korean culture, which is why it's a big thing when um, the last emperor of Korea dies because that was the culture. The culture died along with him, not just the moment he died, but the family, you know, kind of died out. So there's even even once even once they get their independence, basically um, from Japan in 1945, there's nowhere to go. They don't know what to do because their leaders have been dead for 30 years. The last guy who ran Korea died. He dies in 1919. So he dies 10 years into Japanese occupation. 25 years later, they don't have anybody. They're, they're, they're literally running. You know, they're not running scared, but they're just. They have no. They don't know. They don't know what to do. They've been given a government that you know everyone has a different feeling about what should happen, and that's you know people do take advantage of that. that, that that's how we end up with two different sides. Uh, people have feeling, feeling feeling different ways about how to run a government, but it all starts with it. Really does start with the last emperor of Korea, Kojong. Right, Kojong became the king of Korea while he was still a boy. Right during the first years of his reign, uh, power was in the hands of his father Taewon Gun. As a regent. Uh, his father attempted to restore and revitalize the country. Uh, let's see, Taewon Gun was kidnapped and taken to China in 1882. Um, so the power passed to dude's mom. Uh, her name was Min. She felt differently. Uh, she was actually killed by the Japanese in 1895. Uh, so this, you know, the Japanese and the Korean men, you find that they, they, there's a reason a lot of Japanese and Koreans don't like each other. There's hundreds of years of reasons. So basically, during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904, uh, Japan invaded Korea and forced the emperor to sign a treaty allowing the Japanese to use the country as a military base and to place advisors in the government. I mean, that's pretty much, it just spells out the end for Korea right there. After the war, Japan set up a protectorate in Korea. In 1907, the king was forced to abdicate in favor of his son after, he came li after it came to light that he had dispatched emissaries to plead Korea's case at the Second Hague Convention. So really what we're seeing, I mean, is just slowly, but surely, Japan is just just taking over Korea. And so then we get to military control by Japan. So this is what I'm about to cover for you right now is essentially from the 1910s to 1945. It's about 35 years of Japan controlling Korea. Like I said, it wasn't a fun control. This isn't like, um, you know, like your boss who just lets you work or whatever. This is like helicopter mom and mom also wants you to do everything she's telling you to do and kind of wants you to just be like her. She wants to make a little mini mom, what she wants to do. Um, so yeah, Japan set up a government in Korea 
was filled up basically the government was basically filled up by all these japanese generals and admirals uh, they were appointed by the japanese emperor the koreans were deprived of freedom of assembly of association of press and speech all of that just deprived of all of that you can, you can say they were oppressed if you will uh, many private schools were closed because they did not meet in cert meet certain japanese uh, standards which are relatively arbitrary i mean the japanese were kind of just making this stuff up so they would have to close um, the colonial authorities used their own school system as a tool for assimilating korea to japan placing primary emphasis on teaching the Japanese language and excluding the educational curriculum, such as subjects of Korean language and Korean history. What I'm saying is basically they came in there and said, like I said, you're just going to, you're going to speak, you're going to speak Japanese. We're going to talk about Japanese stuff. Don't you bring up that Korean stuff. I don't want to hear any Korean, not even close, not even K-pop. I don't want to hear any of it. Uh, so the Japanese built nationwide transportation and communication networks and established a monetary and financial system. They did all this. They basically came into Korea, who was already, already, like I said, a functioning government, functioning they, you know, they, they have literally a dynasty that's been in control for 600 years, excuse me, 500 years. Japan comes in like low key, the kind of the same way we took Hawaii, honestly, um, has them sign everything over. And all of a sudden Japan's king now, Japan is running things. Obviously the Koreans didn't like that. Uh, wouldn't, couldn't do much about it. Um, the former emperor Kojong, like I said, he was a symbol of, of independence throughout this time. Even in the early times have been like, you know, okay, like we're, we're taken over by Japan, but, but you know. Our emperor is still here. He's still alive. Joe Gomes still kicking strong. You know, we're going to, we're going to take it back sometime. Then he dies. And everybody's like, oh, oh, like we might just be Japanese now. Like it might just be time to, time to, you know, just start being Japanese, whatever that means. But that's, that's what that means. You know, you know, the Koreans would try to have an uprising. They, you know, they didn't like it. Uh, they would do a, a few uh, protests. Um, they had what's called the March 1st movement. Um, peaceful demonstrations that were going against, where they were trying to appeal to the Japanese to kind of say, hey, you know, we're not too mad at you guys. We just kind of want to have a little bit of our culture. And Japan was like, no, no, it's not happening. Sorry. We're going to arrest 47,000 Koreans. Um, and we're going to kill, what do you got, about 7,500 of you guys just for doing so. So no, Japan was not really with that. They weren't really um, loving that idea. And so now we're going to get into the actual kind of World War II portion of the Korean War and then kind of slide right into the Korean War. Because really, I mean, the, the question is how did it happen, not what happened. So we're not going to do a blow-by-blow blow of what happened in the Korean War. The question truthfully is how did the Korean War happen? And I mean, I feel like I've already answered the question, but it's worth it to go through more details. The Korean War really happened because we, you know, Japan had been running that country for years and then we just take Japan out and we just hope that, oh, they'll just figure it out on their own. They'll come to their own conclusion about what's a good government to have and we'll have no wars, and there won't be any problems. Well, that's not what happened in the history of ever. Never has that happened. It won't happen. You need to have some sort of situation, some sort of system in place to allow for it. Because what we see, and this is what happened, we, in, in the Cairo Dec Declaration, uh, which was issued on December the 1st, 1943, by the U.S., Great Britain, and China, um, they pledged independence for Korea in quote-unquote in due course. Literally, that's like if you said, um, OK, so uh, I'm going to end up I'm going to run that family. I'm going to let that family or let me have a better. Let's say like if I said, oh, are you going to you going to take a trip tomorrow? I was like, yeah, I'm going to take a trip. Have you, have you prepared for it? Oh, it's going to happen all in due course, meaning, no, I'm not prepared. I don't really know what's going to happen. Right. Like, oh, it's you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll fit. You know, it's a super vague phrase. And literally, I mean, the people of Korea felt the same way and asked the American government, hey, what does that mean? They asked for interpretation. Uh, there was their request received no answer at all. Uh, at the Yalta conference in 1945, President Ro Roosevelt proposed to Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin a four-power trusteeship of Korea consisting of the United States, Great Britain, US USSR, and China. Basically, what they would end up, end up doing in Berlin, we saw how well that worked out for them. Basically, they don't have any idea. Never they never have any idea. They never never have any idea what to do with these what to do with these countries once they take them over. Once they've taken these governments over and gotten rid of whoever's in power they're just like oh well you know what if we all ran it what if all four of it no why would that no it's no but evidently, I mean, evidently Stalin he agreed to it uh, only in principle but they didn't actually reach any formal agreement about it and that's kind of what left it still being the way it was then we have the general order number one uh, which is a very vague name in itself it was drafted on, drafted on August the 11th by the US for Japanese surrender um, the terms for Korea in there provided that Japanese forces north of the 38th latitude Surrender to the Soviets and those below it surrender to the Americans. So that is quite literally where we get the beginning of the 38th parallel. And if you know anything about uh, the Korean War, you know that a Korea is still divided along that 38th parallel. And it really comes down to the fact of when they did the general order number one, 
like they said, the um, Japanese forces in this area, northern area, so they surrendered to the Soviets. The ones in the south surrendered to the Americans. That's where we get it from. And so that wasn't supposed to be like the end. You know, there was supposed to be more to it. But I mean, and I don't know why we continue to trust throughout history these Russians. I don't know why. I really don't. But basically, once they surrendered, the um, the Russians kind of just started to seal off the 30th parallel. Like they were just like, nah, we, um, you know, we're good. We're good on that. We're good on that. We're going to keep our people. We're going to keep our North Koreans. You keep your South Koreans where they are. You know, don't you bring them over that parallel. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. And so actually, I have here a, squ- a small little bit. And this, I found this interesting, interesting of how Kim Jong-il came to, or, or the Kim family. I don't think it's Kim Jong-il. It's the one before his father. How he came to power. Kim Il-sung uh, came to power in North Korea. And it's right around this exact time of when we're... Um, when, the, when they're splitting up, because basically Kim Il-sung had been a member of the resistance um, in Korea. They had these Marxist revolutionaries, right, who had fought against the Japanese as part of the Chinese-dominated guerrilla armies in Manchuria and China. So they, these people were fighting against Jap- Jap- Japan to that they could have, you know, a Marxist Korea, basically. And one of these exiles um, was a minor but successful guerrilla named Kim Il-sung. And he received some training in Russia and had been a major in the Soviet army. And once all this happens, once the um, once the Japanese surrender to uh, the Soviets, and then the Soviets are trying to figure out, you know, what they're going to do with this with the government that they are now trying to have control over. Over, they take uh, they use Kim Il Sung, and they they prop him up as a uh, as a hero uh, from his efforts when he was fighting with the Chinese against the Japanese, and he kind of becomes the figurehead for the new North Korean government. And that's how that's I think this was that Kim Jong Un's grandfather, I believe it is. Um, it's just, I mean, I, I, you always wonder, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting. All right, and uh, so before we get to the actual war, uh, I wanted to cover just briefly what it was like in, in both the north and the southern uh, zones, just to kind of understand the differences and see what these people were going through before they got to the actual uh, the fighting part. So uh, the southern zone, start with that first. And like I was saying earlier, the end of Japanese rule caused political confusion among Koreans in the entire country. You know, the, I mean, it's, it's, the, you had taken from them what had been, for some of them people, it's all they ever knew. You know, we're talking 35, 35 years, 35 plus years of occupation. So if you're 30 years old, all you know is Japanese occupation. You don't even really know what it means to have autonomy or fight for, or, you know, have independence or anything like that. Um, so because of that, you know, various political groups, you know, kind of sprang up all over the place. Um, although they were rough, they were roughly divided into rightists, leftists, middle of the rotors, they had a common goal, in, which was the immediate attainment of self-government. As early as 1945, August 16th, uh, some Koreans organized a committee for the preparation of Korean independence, headed by Woon Hyung La La L Y U H. How do you pronounce? I mean, it just looks like La. You know, it's probably not that at all, but that's what it looks like to me. And he was closely associated with the leftists. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of their government. And but from what I understand, it was you know it was, or it was different. It was is similar but not the same to like Berlin, as the, you know one side was run in a Soviet manner, the northern side, and then the southern side was run in a more, um, more Western way. So, so the U.S. policy in, in Korea was to establish a trusteeship uh, that would supersede both the American and Soviet occupation forces in, in Korea. So their idea was to kind of let this, you know, let's create something that would then supersede both of our, you know, participation an effort to get back their country in a way that we got it, which was, you know, the whole one. Let's see. So, uh, let's see. By 1948, uh, the goal of the UN was to create a um, an independent South Korea, since they realized that uh, Russia was not really going to play ball with the unification of the country. Um, let's see. So, bam, we'll get to talk about the northern side. So, unlike the U.S. forces in the south, uh, the Soviet army marched into the north in 1945, uh, and they were accompanied by a, a band of expatriate Korean Korean communists. So they came with Koreans with them, which is different than what the Americans did. I mean, they, 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 you know, they, they're, they're, they're playing a different ball. And I think one of them, like I said, was Kim Il-sung. He was one of the people that came into, if I, if I have my information correctly, he was one of the people that came into North Korea um, and helped to kind of bring them back to life. By placing these Korean um, ex- expatriates in positions of power, the Soviet Union easily set up a communist-controlled government in the north because people were, you know, they were like, oh yeah, we we, we like these guys, they they look like us, they are us. Um, so this was also, you know, eventually he would come to power th- through this. Let's see if there's anything else I really want to say about the north before we get into it. Like I said, uh, Kim Il-sung was a major in the Red Army during this time. 
He was eventually elected the first secretary of the, of the Korean Central Bureau of the Communist Party. Like I said, he would go on to father basically all of the same leaders. They all they're all Kims, you know, the same same bloodline now. All right, so let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to the Korean War. All right, we talked about it. We talked about the beginnings. We talked about Korea. We've talked about a lot of stuff, but let's talk about the war. So the war broke out on June 25th, 1950, right? And this is when North Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel and invaded South Korea. North Korean leader Kim Il-sung launched the attack once he had received a promise of support from Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Remember, we covered him on the last week's uh, Bite Size Bio. In January 1950, U.S. Secretary of State Dean Ekeson had delivered a speech in which he said South Korea and Taiwan were not part of the American defensive perimeter, quote-unquote, uh, which seemed to indicate the U.S. Would, would keep out of a Korean conflict. This is what gave them the idea that if we come over the 38th parallel, we can maybe take the rest of Korea for ourselves. Well, they would find out that is not the case. While the U.S. Strategic Air Command was well prepared to launch an all-out attack against the Soviet Union, it was less clear how it could use atomic weapons in a limited conflict like Korea. Now, if you listened to this podcast, I've covered, I think, in multiple of the past episodes, we don't even realize how close we all have come to being blown up throughout the years. I mean, the amount of presidents who wanted to, and I just, it just, you know, it goes without saying, you know Trump wanted to nuke somebody. You know at least once a month, if not once a week, he just brought up the idea for anything, probably anything. We have problems with, you know, oh, China or, you know, some some random country in South America. He's like, well, I mean, we got those small nukes, right? They just, you know, we got the, the baby nukes. We could drop a baby nuke. He probably makes them make it up, but there's no such thing as a baby nuke. Are you going to baby atomic bomb somebody? Um, but yeah, the, the amount of times that presidents throughout the years, I mean, literally when I, like I said, I think it was in, um, I'm not sure why it came up, but I think it was, oh no, it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, it was during the last episode, I think I said, because <clears throat> I've, 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 I've seen it mentioned um, in documentaries. Eisenhower had no plan for communism. Eisenhower didn't know what to do with communism. He left there, and I mean, we're still fighting it to a degree now, but not in the capacity that we were then, but he, his, his idea that he gave to JFK when he left was, how about, you know, we could just bomb them. We could just, we just blow them all up. We just, we just take that right off the map, just erase it, you know? That's how we do that. That was his plan, to kill millions of people in the name of, I guess, democracy. I'm not sure. But so I take that just to go back and say, like, they even thought about trying to use the atomic bomb in Korea. I mean, we'd look back now and in hindsight and know that it's only been used once um, on, or twice on people, but one, one actual, you know, war. Could you imagine? I couldn't imagine if we actually had it used somewhere else. Uh, back um, to the Korean War. So on August the 1st, 1950, uh, the decision was made to send the 9th bomb wing to Guam as an atomic force. Uh, 10 B-29s loaded with unarmed atomic bombs set out, for the, set out for the Pacific. On August the 5th, one of the planes crashed during a takeoff from Fairfield Swiss and Air, Fit, Air Force Base near San Francisco, killed a dozen people, and scattered the mildly radioactive uranium of the bomb's tamper around the airfield. I'm not sure what a tamper is, but I'm guessing that's just its all the stuff that it had. Um, so the rest of them got there. They didn't, they didn't explode. They never ended up using them. Uh, at a press conference on November 30th, uh, President Truman confirmed that he had been actively considering using atomic bombs in Korea since the beginning of the war. Um, I mean, he's obviously, you know, the only person that ever do it. And he was thinking about doing it, doing it again. A uh, dude from Britain came over and was like, yo, can you please chill with that? Speak, bro. That's not, uh, that's not cool beans. You know, we're not, we're not, no one's trying to have you blow up more Asian people, bro. Can we, that's not, that's not a good look. Uh, but yeah, so then when we get to that, um, at first the North Koreans made rapid progress throughout uh, South Korea and they quickly took the Korean capital of Seoul, drove back the South Korean and American troops back to the southern part of Busan. Isn't that called Burma now? Isn't Busan Burma? Am I wrong? I think it is. Um, General Douglas MacArthur, MacArthur managed to hold him off after the Wagwan Bridge. Um, Let's see, over the Neck Don River was blown up. It was the, the Wagwan Bridge was blown up on August the 3rd. Uh, UN forces then began to resupply and fortify their position with a defensive perimeter. The first British troops landed at Busan soon after, so we brought in all the guys, um, all the dogs, as, as Drake would say. They, once, the, once, once, once the British guys got there, they were immediately sent to the Battle of Neck on the western part of Busan. Uh, I think I was saying the UN helped them on the other side of that. I'm not 100% sure. Let's see. So yeah, they would kind of go back and forth there. Um, say about thirty thousand, I think, by this time, in in the like in nineteen fifty to fifty one, had lost their lives. Like I said, it would end up being two point five million overall. 
Uh, I'm not sure if there's much else to say specifically about the battles. Because I mean, we could talk battles, but that's I don't think that that's that interesting as far as like to make for content. I definitely would. Um, you know, people lost their lives and it's stuff. You don't want to just gloss over stuff like that. I mean, these are full on people that are doing this stuff, uh, and war is just it is it is monstrous. And I I've never been, um, but I just from from seeing it and just the, from hearing people that talk about it, it sounds uh, supremely god awful. Uh, let's see. Anything else I want to say? I'm trying to find because I got because what also inter- interested me, and we won't talk about this, is that this is happening in the 50s. Uh, you know, this is this is the beginning of Eisenhower's 50s. The, the nuclear family is coming in full force to America, to a to a neighborhood near you. You know, this is um, this is before white flight, or I think right around before you're right right before white flight. So the white people are just filling up suburbs to the hilt. You know. Just green lawns as far as the eye can see. And this is the topic of conversation at the, at the dinner table, is the Korean War. You know, we haven't gotten to Vietnam yet. We haven't, uh, we haven't put anybody on the moon, you know. We're not even 100% sure. Get this. I mean, because truthfully, like I said, we're not even 100% sure Hitler's dead. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a foregone conclusion now. But you think about it. You think back. I didn't realize. Because that's, that's another part, another layer of this Cold War. Another reason for the distrust of the Soviets is, you know, they've always kept this stuff close to the vest. They wouldn't come out and say that Hitler was fully dead until the mid to late sixties, I believe it is. At six like sixty seven. I don't know. Check 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 the facts. I I mentioned it a couple episodes ago. Because like I said, the moment that hit that that Stalin came into Berlin, his he was like, Oh, I'm his all he wanted to do was just sow seeds of of of, of confusion. You know, all he wanted to do was just, you know, have control and have nobody else really know what's going on. And so he they took Hitler's body, and we're like, we don't know where it's at. We're, what? What Hitler? What Hitler? What Hitler? Adolf? No. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's all that to say. Just this stuff, man. It's it's deeper. It's it's so deep. But I have a quick timeline of the Korean War, and then I, we might be just about done. Really, I mean, I do want to mention that China got involved in the Korean War. It's worth mentioning. I think I'll talk about the negotiations. Okay, we'll talk about the POWs. That's what we're talking about. So we're going to give you the timeline. We're going to cover a couple of those things. And then we're going to get out of here, folks. Uh, let's go back. Let's see if we go back up here to a lot of scrolling. A lot of scrolling. 50s. Timeline of North Korea. So like I said, June 25th, right? 1950, the war starts. North Korea invades uh, South Korea via the 38th parallel. June 27th, uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 83 is declared North Korea at, they declared North Korean actions uh, constituted a breach of peace, meaning they you know, they kind of just um, you know they went they stepped over the line. Let's see by August from August 4th to September the 16th, the U.S. and South Korean troops established the Busan perimeter and prevented North Korea from capturing South Korea. Where we are, we're going to jump a little bit through here in the next year. Uh, January of 1951, Chinese People's Volunteer Army. The names they make up for these. Things, man, like what is going on? Chinese People's Volunteer Army. What? All right. They, so that, that they pushed the UN forces back across the 38th parallel and they recaptured Seoul. Uh, that was in January of 1951. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Yeah, July 10th, 1951. Uh, the peace talks begin uh, and are eventually continued at Pan Munjon. Uh, 1953. The armistice agreement was signed at Pan Munjon. It was tempor- temporarily ended all fighting. Uh, a permanent peace treaty was never signed. It's still not been signed, and technically both sides are still at war. That's why, you know, that's why you can't, there's not a lot of going back and forth for people in Korea. You know, you kind of just pick a Korea and you keep that Korea. You know, you, like you, you're born in a blood neighborhood, you just stay a blood, you know. You, uh, you don't get to go cripping, you know, whenever you want. You have to stay, you have to keep it CK all day, son, you know what I mean? But um, they still do that. They're, they're, they're still at war. So. Uh, let's get down to what else we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the POWs because that was, to me, that was always the more interesting part um, of war was the POWs. I read books about POWs when I was, in, when I was a kid um, in, you know, about Vietnamese or like the Vietnam War POWs. Uh, and it's really messed up only because of the atrocities that, that are usually committed to them. I mean, it's, you know, I, why I had immense respect um, for Senator McCain because of what I know he went through, I could not, or you know what I mean, I couldn't even imagine if I could. Being, you know, he was one of the, one of those guys, uh, not in this war, obviously he was in the, in the Vietnam War, uh, but was put in one of those what they, uh, the, like the bamboo cages, 
That's one of my fears in life. I don't want to just, I guess we're going to go there. We're going to take it deep this week on HTTH. Tell you about my fears. Um, is to be in just in a, in, a, in a small box that I can't stand up in. Scares me sometimes out of my sleep. Uh, it's just something that, you know, I just want to wake up and make sure I can still stand up. Just make sure I got that freedom. You know, just, I could not freak out. I would think of my friend. That's what he did. He did it for, I forget how long. That's why he couldn't raise his arms above his shoulders. This is for being stuck in a box for, I couldn't, I don't even know how long. Uh, you know, let's find out. We got the internet at our fingertips. How long was Senator McCain a POW? Let's see. We, you know, we're, we should definitely talk about this because he was freed in 1972. So this may come up. Um, let's see. How long was he tortured? How long? Shot down. Five years. Five years, man. That's wild. And he, he's from 31 to 36. I'm 32. I don't think I could do it. So my hat's off to you, sir. Rest in peace. Uh, when we're getting back, we're getting we're getting off track here. Let's get back to where we're doing this. We're talking about, we're talking about the POWs of the Korean War, though. All right, so that's... Let me get to my notes here. The big thing, I think, with this was that neither side seemed to be that forthcoming or truthful uh, in, um, in divulging the numbers of POWs that they actually have in their, um, in their control that were actually, actually detained. Uh, the initial assumption by negotiators was that they would follow the revised Geneva Convention of 1949, which required, quote-unquote, the detaining authority uh, the detaining authority that held POWs to return all of them to their homelands as rapidly as possible when, when the war was over. Um, now, we must say also that the war was never actually over, but I don't think that that may have been a problem. I don't know. Uh, this all-for-all policy of a complete, even forced exchange of prisoners was certainly favored by the U.S. because um, They were alarmed by the early reports of the atrocities uh, committed uh, against American POWs by the, Korea, by the North Koreas. The South Korean government, on the other hand, was adamantly opposed to complete involuntary, re- involuntary repatriation since it knew that thousands of detainees in the South were actually South Korean citizens who had been fighting, uh, who had been forced to fight with the KPA. So basically, like, neither, like, there was just, you know, they, they nobody was being, for, like, just straight, straight with anybody. You know, I don't know. This is, this is weird. So both sides agreed to exchange, exchange names uh, of the POWs and the numbers uh, held in various categories, and the results of the tally were, uh, they shocked both parties. So the U.S. Armed Forces were carrying 1,100, uh, but 11.5 uh, men as MIA, right? But the communists only reported about 3,000 actual POWs. Which meant that's about a that's about a you know a eight to nine thousand person discrepancy. Uh, as far as for the South Koreans, um, they were estimated to have eighty eight thousand MIAs, and they only got back about seven thousand. So that's the, the the numbers we're talking like basically saying, oh, we're missing eighty thousand guys. And like, well, we got like seven thousand. So oh, where are the other eighty one thousand of them? Because these are our missing. These aren't even the we 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 got the ones we know are dead. We we got the KIAs. But what about the MIAs? Where the other 81,000 MIAs go? But what they're saying, from what I'm reading, is that I guess that they're thinking that some of the MIAs actually had died in battle, and that just, you know, put them over as KIAs, and they just hadn't been found yet. But yeah, that's pretty much um, the Korean POW. That's the information I think I wanted you to have. Uh, let's see, I want to cover one or two more things. I really wanted to know the aftermath and the full death toll of the Korean War, and then we're going to go ahead and get out of here. I don't have much else to talk about today, this week. We have much more to cover in this 40s to 70s theme that we have, and I think we just added one more thing, man. We're going to be talking about, um, oh, I just, I just, space was in the 70s. Oh, God, it's gone. Oh, no, I don't remember. We were just talking about it. Oh, Senator McCain. We're going to be talking about uh, the Vietnam War and probably the POWs of, of Vietnam, because that, that stuff is wild. Um, so let's see. So they're saying like 5 million people. 5 million people died uh, that's also that's, that's including civilians and more than half of these um, yeah or, or civilians they're saying uh, for 40,000 Americans um, 100,000 wounded so not bad on the Ameri- I mean it's hard to say 40,000 people say not bad I just mean in comparison to the other millions of Koreans that died during this war um, you know came out on, on the lighter side of it they say about 180,000 Chinese people died in uh, the Korean War. And so what we were left with 
after the war, because that's still technically going, was what's called the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. And that's just the part in the middle where nobody can go because they still haven't decided to be a unified Korea. And if you're wondering, the last person to actually die, the last American to die due to hostile action uh, in Korea, uh, was 1994, not too long ago. His name was David Hillemon, and um, he was killed when his helicopter was shot down over North Korea. So yeah, no, not much more to mention about Korea, the, North, the, the, the Korean War. We got North Korea, we got South Korea. Uh, the war's still going on, kind of. Uh, we got the DMZ. Like I said, someone was just killed in the last 30, 30 years in a war that's supposed to have been over 50, 70 years ago. Um, but yeah, that's been uh, the Korean War. All right, so that was the Korean War. Hope you guys liked it. Um, pretty good episode of How Did That Happen? I'm, you know, I really didn't know much about the Korean War at all before I went into this. Know a lot. I think it can really be summed up in just in the same way that so many, so many. If you really think about it, in these last um, in this theme in in this in the 20th century for sure. So we can go back to World War One as well. From what I'm about to say, but there's so many times in history in this 20th century where we just we just left a government, we left a country like disenfranchised and having no way of 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 providing for themselves or governing themselves you know we, we did that that's what happened in germany in the first you know war afterwards and that's what happens in vietnam that's what happens in korea it it happened in berlin and you know in germany we did it so many times you would think at some point people would learn they would really learn like, hey we can't just come in here I mean, we, we tried to we did the same thing in the middle east you know we and we just there's got to be a better script for I'm not even sure what you call it. I mean, for 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 rebirthing a nation. I mean, you know, it's because it, it doesn't work time and time again. And that's what you see here. That's all you see is because you know Japan was running into Korea, and then we take over Japan and we make Japan give up Korea, and we just Korea just like just kind of you know with with no structure just falls to the floor, and then people are the people are scattered and left to just fend for themselves and and find their own government while also being influenced by either side. Uh, you know the, the the West and the USSR, and that's what you get. I mean, we're not going to relitigate it now in the in the post part, but that's what um that's that's the Korean War. Hope you guys liked it. Um, what do we got? We got the who's coming up next? We got a few people been in cover for the BSBs. Uh, so many of them. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to work some women in here for the for the for the 60s in the 50s and 60s because all we've done a lot of dudes, a lot of dudes. And I was trying to before I was trying to keep it you know pretty even, but. In when you're talking about these wars and, and politics, and this, during this time, there were just weren't as many female politicians, so it's a lot easier. It's just easier to you find yourself always talking about guys. When you know, I can do some work. And I'm gonna find I'm gonna find some prominent women uh, during this time. We have already covered Jackie O on the BSB way way back, like 30 episodes ago. So if you want to go back and listen to that, as if it's somewhat involved in this theme, do that for sure. But yeah, we got more coming. I, I do think I'm gonna keep going in order as I've kind of been going. We we covered World War Two. You know, we covered the Berlin Wall, which actually, I mean, the Berlin Wall actually hasn't even gone up yet in this time, because it's not, we're talking about the Korean War right now, it would actually come like eight years later, but I'm going to keep going kind of in order of, um, you know, the, of these events, so the next thing coming up will be, I'm not sure, we'll probably cover something in, in, in Eisenhower's government, uh, and then we'll get up to Kennedy, but um, but yeah, thank you guys for coming back week to week and press and play, uh, I really do appreciate it, um, I'm going to keep trying to do some, mixing things up and, and keep the podcast, you know, new and because you know we're coming up on um, coming up on two years. Coming up on two years. It'll be two years in January. This podcast has been going, so we want to keep it, you know, kind of progressing and always kind of keep things uh, changing up. But yeah, before I start rambling too much, thank you guys for pressing play and uh, give us five stars wherever you find this. Two stars if you didn't like it. Tell us why you didn't like it because constructive criticism is always welcome. I'll uh, see you guys next week with the next bite-sized bios. <laughs>